we have the, in spring 1916. In spring 1916, especially for Syria, when the second wave of genocide started, this time Armenian didn't have any other choice. Orders were sent for two alternatives, either conversion to Muslim religion or deportation to Derzor. Everybody knew that deportation to Derzor meant killing, annihilation of the people, and whoever wants to stay had to convert, accept the Muslim religion. So this is the third phase, and indeed they sent a lot of Armenians into Derzor region for annihilation. And I cannot go into detail. There is another important aspect of this process, how they regulate this process. This is the demography that they used. They continuously counted the number of surviving Armenians, almost on a weekly basis. And they always compared these numbers with the living, existing Muslim population in the area. And the general policy was, the, finally, at the end, the Armenians in the region should not exceed 5 or 10 percent of the Armenian population. Especially in Syria, it was a clear order, 10 percent. And for the Anatolia, especially in the western part, it was 5 percent. So this assimilation policy was also a part of an overarching demographic policy. So this shows us <clears throat> uh, the question requires, the answer is, was there a rational behind changing policies being followed during this whole process? And with which motives did Ottomans, Ottoman officials act when freely permitting religious conversion or forbidding, forbidding it, or insisting forcibly that outside of that, Islam was the only choice remaining. remaining. What principle motivated to them act? And as I said, this is uh, my argument is that it was a governability. This was the basic policy, and Armenians were counted regularly, and I will read you one other document uh, to show how Armenian, how the Ottoman government was strictly following the numbers of the Armenian and according to which criteria. This is a telegram sent July 1916 after sending to Derzor in just in the middle of when the uh, massacre started and <clears throat> similar telegrams were sent afterwards also, but this shows very clearly. And it says following, uh, in July, they ask that a tabulated list, a tabulated list be prepared on the issue and sent back. It is following, quote, the need is communicated via circular for the rapid preparation and dispatch of a tabulated list by district containing the quantities within the province district of number one, local Armenians. Number two, foreign Ar Ar Armenians. Number three, those left as Catholics and Protestants. Number four, those kept in their places as families of soldiers. Number five, those remaining by converting. Number six, Armenian remaining due to special orders. So the list must be prepared according to these specific criteria and assimilation is, in that sense, a very structural element. So this is the part for the religious conversion. How much time? What is time? How Should much I? Time do you want? Uh, I can go on the children aspect. Uh, yes. Okay, the children. Yeah. <clears throat> the policy towards Armenian boys and girls were different than the majority of Armenians. And it was also very well organized policy. I have to make a distinction, but or maybe a very important remark here. 
I'm not debating or discussing that these orders implemented fully 100% in the local regions. We don't know how these policies had been implemented in different places. We don't have the local studies, unfortunately. This is one of the major problem in our field. We have a lot of central orders and we can now, based on Ottoman documents, we can reconstruct actually the policy of the governing party, but what we need additionally really to look very closely how these policies implemented in each specific provinces so that to get an accurate picture of the development. So when I'm talking about here the, the policy towards the children, I don't mean that they implement these 100 percent in each provinces. It might differ. We know from the uh, memoirs that really there were certain differences, but important thing is to get the skeleton, the structure behind this. I think the main part of this policy towards the kids was that the girls had to be converted to Muslim religion and they must be forcibly married with uh, boys, Muslim boys. The first cable on this matter, on regarding the children, was sent to the provinces in late June 1915. The date is very important. 26 June 1915. The major deportation from Hartford, from, to my knowledge, now if, I think that it started from 1st July from that region. So the major deportations hasn't started yet when they sent this telegram to certain regions. 26 June 1915, almost one week before the major wave of deportation, and it is a great significance that this telegram, actually, it's also important, was not sent by Interior Ministry, which is normally in charge of deportation, but by Ministry of Education. Use the cipher office of the Interior Ministry. I think these small details are very important. It is not an order from Interior Ministry. It is an order from the Ministry of Education. And this shows also how the issue of children and young girls had been discussed in the cabinet or in the small group. And a decision was taken and the Ministry of Education was instructed to implement these measures. The telegram sent directly by the education minister with the notation secret and to be deciphered according to Interior Ministry's cipher office code. It is also written. It says that decipher this telegram based on your own Interior Ministry codes. And contains the following instructions. Quote, since considerations had been given to the idea of education and upbringing of the children under the age of 10, those Armenians who have been relocated or in some fashion deported, either through the establishment of an orphanage or the gathering of them into already existing orphanage, it is requested it to be reported back with all haste how many such orphaned children there are within the province and whether or not there is a suitable building in existence for the establishment of an orphanage. So the telegram is for me very important because in most places, Armenian hadn't been sent yet at this date. They are sending beforehand on the possible numbers of the children who they are planning to collect and also asking about the buildings, whether they could be brought into it because of upbringing based on Islamic culture, because they needed, this is another important debate, what is the policy behind this collecting kids around number, uh, age group of 10. So uh, 
almost two weeks after the first telegram, another telegram was sent, this time from the Interior Ministry's Office of Tribal and Immigrant Settlement to numerous provinces and provinces and provincial districts containing the following instructions, quote, for the purpose of the care and upbringing, bakım ve terbiye of children who probably will be left, who probably will be left without a guardian becomes orphan during the course of Armenian transportation and deportation, their distribution to notables and the men of repute in villages and kazas in the counties where Armenians and foreigners are not found and the payment of 30 grush monthly from the special appropriations for immigrants for the children who will be left over after the distribution and will be given to those who do not have the means of subsistence are seen as suitable. Wow. Not only that, I don't know whether I have here, there is another telegram, I tell it in order to make it shorter, another singular and telegram sent to the provinces and said, whoever adopted an Armenian children, kid, has the right, heritage right of these children. And there was really, indeed, we know that from the missionary accounts, fight, uh, tense between some Muslim notables because they wanted to take a wealthy Armenians girls so that they could take over the heritage rate of, right of this girl and get the uh, all materials belong to this girl. And this is how they really also developed a material incentive for the distribution of the Muslim children, uh, Armenian children. And uh, also the phrase, I think, the children who are likely to become orphans in this is very extremely important. And this clearly shows that such an outcome to the deportation was known in advance taken into account. It was pre-planned. And maybe last word in that sense, uh, if you read some Armenian memoirs, uh, you will you remember, maybe you have heard from your parents, of course, I mean, uh, I should not tell all these stories. When they collected Armenian children in certain places, they took away, they didn't have the, of course, IDs, they couldn't figure out how old they were, but estimated for the bodybuilding and their uh, high and how strong they were, they took away a certain amount of children they thought they were more than 13, 14. And this is from the accounts, we know that Armenian children who were in these orphanages or certain places where Armenian parents left the kind of their children, those taken away and were killed. Up 9, 13, 14. The logic is very simple. You cannot assimilate them. And it was done the same for the children below the age three. I read it from extensively from an Armenian survivor accounts because I cannot say his name now. Uh, an old man wrote this memoir around 2000, public in Eng published in English in California. He describes about his own brothers. Actually, his brother was younger than him, but bodily uh, more high and developed. They took him and they, they had another kid, less than three, they took him also and lost. He never found, and not only this, his own brothers, in this place where he was taken away, there were maybe hundreds of kids, and he wrote in his memoir saying that over 60 years or 70 years, I have been trying to find one single trace of these friends or my, uh, this individual that I know. I couldn't find because they were all killed in a way. So, uh, it is clear from all this that Ottoman government used assimilation as an important 
part of its own destruction policy. So we have to take this aspect seriously and rebuild in the genocidal process. And especially you will see that, uh, <clears throat> especially in Syria, when the first convoys arrived there, there were really a serious settlement policy of Ottoman Empire, Ottoman government. Armenians were resettled, new neighborhoods were established in certain places, but it is almost never written and touched on that topic because we all thought if we thought or we discussed that there was a settlement policy, then it could work against 1948 convention and be used as an argument that it could not be genocide what happened to Armenians and is totally ignored. But what happens then, it, we cannot explain the destruction process. What we need to understand this destruction policy in its fully, to understand the logic behind it, and we can understand from here that actually it was not the religious fanatism behind it. It was not the religious fanatism of the Ottoman authorities in Istanbul. It was a calculated demographic policy to destroy the Armenian nation as such and to re reduce their numbers to a level which could not be cons considered as a problem. So this was my last word. Thank you very much for listening. First of all, thank you very much for your very deep and penetrating presentation here tonight. Uh, it's much appreciated. And it's a difficult subject, I think, for all of us. My question relates back to Lenkin, where you pointed out that one of the major points of his uh, treatise on the genocide, qualifying as genocide, was the fact of, of cultural uh, destruction. Uh, and then subsequently, social scientists uh, kind of disavowed that view, and it was never written into the convention. And even after that, social scientists had some differences as to what that should be and still argue today. Uh, of those social scientists, uh, do you have any idea of how many of these uh, were in favor of the cultural uh, statement? destruction being included? Genocide scholars, it is widely accepted. Right, but, it was, but there had to be some people at that time who agreed with the idea that it should be included, right? It should be. It should be among the social scientists of the day. Right. Uh, it, it wouldn't be 100%, but there should have been some small percentile of those people, but you have no idea of who they might be or yes, uh, what exactly, yeah. percentage is. I don't know, yeah. exactly, yeah. The whole thing did shift today where it is accepted. Exactly, yes. Uh, there are still, I mean, at the beginning there were really scholars in social science also, they stick on the term a lot. 1948 convention was for them an important term and they stick on it. This was one of the reasons, for example, why most of the Holocaust scholars didn't consider, or still today, Native Americans the, uh, here in the United States as a genocide, because uh, of this cultural destruction aspect was very major here, and they didn't consider this as a genocide. Well, that was my whole point to follow that a little bit, because everything you mentioned pertained to cultural genocide. Yes. It's just the way it is, unfortunately. Thanks. Mr. Uh, I am the daughter of a survivor who wrote a book and he writes about the assimilation efforts uh, that the Turkish government did in 1916 uh, and he is describing the orphanage in which he was held. Uh, the orphanage was established by Jamal Pasha it was the orphanage of Antura, which was a Lazarist. Uh, yeah, very famous one. Yes, we yes. know that. Uh, school that was converted into orphanage. There were 1,200 orphans there, and during the four years period, out of the 1,200, only 400 survived because they were beaten to death if they spoke Armenian. Uh, and he described in detail all these tortures, the falakha, 
uh, that they endured during the four years in that orphanage until the end of the First World War. Um, I have the book with me and I would like to uh, continue uh, my talk with you later after Thank you. the panel is over. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks. Tana, can you add anything more about that, the, the uh, efforts of, of Jamal Pasha and uh, Halida Adib in, in uh, Lebanon, in Syria? We can add something. It was uh, Jamal Pasha's policy, and even Raymond Kevorkian used the term Jamal Pasha's Armenians. Uh, in Syria, when Armenian uh, settled, my version of the process to explain the process is in the following way. <clears throat> I assume that the Ottoman authorities thought that the number of Armenians who would arrive Syria would be around 10% of the local population. We know from some documents also that they are saying it is almost 10% and we will settle the Armenians here. But the number of Armenians who arrived Syria were more than they expected. And they started a census again. And with this census, when they discovered that the number of Armenians in the Syria way beyond the 10% of the local Muslim population, they organized the second wave. If you, you all know the history a little bit, uh, throughout these camps around Aleppo, they started to emptying from the west towards east and pushing the people. And first time start this emptying of the camps started 1916 January. So this is the reason Andonion says that the decision for the Darzor massacre or 